Jared Diamond's collapse is about societies and civilizations and how they um, exist over long periods of time, or in some cases fail to exist over long periods of time. The book was written, or this one in particular, was published back in 2005. Uh, this is the paperback version. I found it particularly, a particularly interesting read. And I'll just give you a brief summary of the different parts of the book. In the prologue, he goes over two different farms and compares them um, in terms of the, the sim similar, their environments are breaking down over time. In some cases, they were or were not aware of their environments breaking down. Some of the factors that he looks into will be discussed in the later chapters. In part one, we look at modern Montana, which is a state in the United States of America. It looks at farming in Montana and some of the issues there, things like pollution of soils and water supplies due to mining in the local area. In some cases there are issues with overgrazing and deforest deforestation. There's a lot, we'll see deforestation as a key theme through this book. He even points out that it is a key theme later on. And one of the factors as well is outside factors, factors where groups of people outside of the local area can influence the local area in many different ways, politically, financially, and other resources. In part two, in chapter two, we look at a whole bunch of past societies. He starts with Easter Island and how Easter Island became deforested. Some of the main factors for the reason why Easter Island became deforested is partly due to its distance away from Southeast Asia. Here we have the, the main factors of what, what affects deforestation on Pacific Islands. This is on page 116. Deforestation is more severe on dry islands than wet islands, cold high latitude islands than warm equatorial islands, old volcanic islands than young volcanic islands, islands without aerial ash fallout than islands with it, Islands far from Central Asia's dust plume than islands near it. Islands without Makatea than islands with it. And Makatea is its beaches and shores and islands that have that are based on coral reef. And if an island ha has Makatea, it's harder to walk on. It can cut your feet and your boots, even if you have boots. So if you, the island has Makatea, it's going to be less likely to be deforested because people aren't going to be able to work on it. Another factor is low islands than high islands, remote islands than islands with near neighbours, and small islands than big islands. So there are several factors that, are, that can influence whether or not a, an island is going to be deforested. And he goes into a lot of these different factors and discusses them briefly in some cases. He sources his information quite well. Chapter 3 we have Pitcairn and Henderson Islands and he goes into the idea of how different islands can be relatively close to each other and share resources. I believe one of the islands had more meat on it where the other island had better mining and then they also had to share resources with Mangareva. He, he goes over a lot of the interesting factors. He wasn't, and so as a, as a social scientist he's He's relatively interesting to, to read and he, and he explains it quite well and it appears to, re, to source his ideas and the factors quite well. In chapter 4 we have the ancient ones, the Anasazi and their neighbours. And these were a group of people, I believe, in the United States. Or lower lower part of the United States near Mexico, Texas. They were here, They again there was a deforestation and in, during deforestation it exposes streams to the air and so the streams dry up quicker and so when they, when they deforest their forests they exposed their streams, they got less water and they had to rely on resources from nearby towns. There's archaeological evidence for them sourcing their wood from other towns where archaeologists can look at or native to that area types of wood or plant trees I guess 
and they could also tell when those trees were cut down and what age those trees were when they were used to build uh, the houses. Chapter 5 we have the Maya collapses or Maya. The deforestation theme runs a lot through here. The Maya, the Maya or Maya civilizations have problems with deforesting the tops of their valleys and that causes soil erosion and makes it makes made, made their fields and farms less reliable. Chapter 6 goes into the Scandinavian Viking stories. Uh, we start with chapter 6 where they went into Iceland. Um, a reoccurring theme for Iceland and in the next chapters Greenland as well is the idea that when the Viking groups arrived in Iceland and Greenland they saw a lot of forests and they assumed or they, they, they started cutting down a lot of the forest and that exposed the soil to higher rates of erosion and at the start there was a lot of resources and then near the end they started or very quickly the, the quality of the soil reduced which meant that their farming while it started well it became very poor over time quite quickly. Here we have chapter 7 with uh, the Greenland, the Norse Greenland societies. One, part of their issues were the types of resources they were using. In one particular case he pointed out that while there were Inuit groups close by the Greenlanders didn't trade with them very all. Well. There wasn't much evidence that they did archaeological evidence. Also they didn't seem to adapt to their, the Greenlanders didn't adapt to their environment as well as the Inuits did. The Inuits did a lot of fishing as that was the main resource in the area and the Greenlanders didn't. So the Greenlanders will try to use traditional farming methods growing sheep and cattle. I believe cattle quickly became untenable and they ate a lot of seal. Um, there was a lot of seal in their rubbish dumps that they found archaeologically. In chapter 8 the story continues about Greenland and how um, their deforestation and the soil quality quickly deteriorates and how the first settlement of Greenland didn't last very long. There's a current settlement of Greenland that's doing, I, think, I believe it requires outside input, but, but this first one that happened back in the 1400s, I believe, or near, near the end, didn't survive very well because they just didn't, they didn't adapt very well and they did too much deforestation and couldn't, their farms weren't with the best. Chapter 9 actually looks starts looking up a little bit. We've, we've, the book goes through a lot of pessimism at the start but there is optimism as you get kind of nearer to the end of the book or um, Jared, Jared says, Jared Diamond says he has a cautious optimism as he says later in the book. Chapter 9 looks at some examples, um, Japan's example of and I believe Germany's as well, where they they saw the issue of deforestation because it was happening so quickly and so they started limiting it and so it's a lot of government regul regulation that helped Japan and Germany out to, to save their forests. Uh, New Guinea in particular, Jared Diamond spent a lot of time in that country and he reckons that, that the New Guinea islands were did a bit better regarding forestation or avoiding deforestation because they had, they had smaller groups of people running smaller groups smaller smaller blocks of land and so if there was deforestation it would highly affect these small groups of people the middle of the book has a bunch of photos um, that get referred to as you read through the book they they give a good visual idea of what's happening with these different societies and and uh, the breakdown of those societies or, or success. In part three we look at modern societies. In chapter 10 we look at Rwanda and the Rwanda genocide and part of the reason, and he goes into more detail than this, but part of the reason why he 
believes Rwanda, the Rwanda genocide was caused, was due to uh, population density and also how farms were traded and how they, smaller farms couldn't survive so they had to sell to uh, people who owned larger farms. Those larger farms would get even bigger. From this book, book's point of view, poor resource management in some cases. In chapter 11 we look at the Dominican Republic and Haiti which is both they're both on one island and he looks at the different ways those societies are managed and some of the histories of I guess I would I would call dictators in some cases or very iron-fisted leaders a very good interesting read it's interesting to see the comparison between those two countries and and how they continued into the future chapter 12 is about china and how it's its development over time its population rate of expansion um, issues of pollution and um, how in some cases first world countries are selling I guess rubbish or their pollution issues to China. Um, some of these issues I don't believe are as relevant currently however the effects are still being worked out at the moment. Chapter 13 is about Australia. Um, he puts mining Australia, he puts it in quotation marks, he says mining Australia and part of the reason why he does that is because Australia is not, he goes into Australia being a poor place to set up farms because of its poor soil quality in general, in general of course. He goes into why there, there's poor soil quality and he compares or he points out that when you're, most countries when they're mining something, when they're mining gold or coal or other resources, commodities, they, you typically want to mine it really quickly, get it done, get it out of the soil and, and then move on. Um, because they're non-renewable resources, you want to get those resources out as soon as possible and stockpile them away. That's in comparison to renewable resources which you want to slowly mine, in quotation marks. But in the case of Australia, when, the, when it was being colonised, the trees were being cut down at a rate much quicker than which they could be replaced. And so that's why he puts mining in quotation marks for this chapter. It's a very interesting chapter. In part four we look at practical lessons that we can take forward as modern societies and as individuals as well. Chapter 14 looks at, I guess, partly human psychology as to why uh, different societies make, make poor decisions even though um, they may, they, some, in some cases they may not be able to tell something bad is going to happen. In some cases they know something's bad going to happen but they still do it anyway. And there's different reasons for that. There can be corporate reasons. There can be the tragedy of the commons. Um, he goes into a lot of interesting, um, I guess, behavioral, behavioral psychology or sociology. It's, it's a very interesting read. Chapter 14. Chapter 15 looks at businesses and how they affect the environment in good ways as well as poor ways. Jared Diamond's answer to the interference of business with the environment would be, in most cases I believe, would be government regulation of some kind. Or, it, or he does say that the public's view of businesses can affect the business's motivations and actions as well so if so in, like if you don't buy a product or stop buying a product from a certain company because of its practices that can cause it to to act in different ways chapter 16 the world of the polder what does it all mean to us today is jared diamond's wrapping up of the book he looks at several factors that can affect uh, where we're going to head factors that we need to watch and monitor as we go into the future. Again, he says he has a cautious optimism and that these problems may be solved in several different ways. He goes into what he calls one-liner objections that are to do with short sentences that a lot of people say that 
try to diminish solutions to, I guess, in what environmentalists provide as, as reasons as to why we should be solving the problems. Now here's an example. There really isn't a world food problem. There is already enough food. We only need to solve the transportation problem of distributing that food to places that need it. The same thing could be said for energy. Or else, the world's food problem is already being solved by the Green Revolution with its new high yield varieties of rice and other crops. Or else it will be solved by genetically modified crops. And so in this case, I guess this chapter is partly about and not in a way like a frequently asked, instead of a frequently asked question, more like frequently given answers that Jared addresses um, one by one with, you know, a couple of paragraphs or so explaining why those, those ideas may not necessarily be true. You know, like the idea that technology may or may not actually save us. So this book was very interesting. I found it. It was a it was a great read. It took me about a week or so. I'd recommend it. I've heard that Jared Diamond can sometimes be. Uh, there are critiques. Sorry, there are critiques of his books, um, and I'm not too up to play in terms of social science and whether or not his his arguments are entirely valid. But he. He remains to me to be at least a little convincing, and so as we as we go forward, I think into the future, I think as individuals and societies, it would be his his advice at least is something that I believe should be uh, taken into account. And so that's Jared Diamond's collapse.